Dr. Simon. Yes. Thank you, Corbin. Thank you. So then they just shuttered the economy. And one thing he wants to talk about is to give his testimony. Yeah. Talk about his ministry and just generally reflect on how Christians in general, but Christian men in particular, should be dealing with this crisis. Brother Barry, I'm going to be asking you a few questions. It can be a long-winded loudmouth every so often, so every so often I'm going to interrupt you. Is that all right? That'll be fine. Okay. He's calm, cool, collected. Feel free to also interject and talk about some of your accomplishments. For example, are you not retired military? I'm a retired Army officer. How long were you in the military? 20 years. 20 years. And where were some of the places you were stationed? I was stationed at Fort Benning, Fort Knox, Western Kentucky University, Western Europe, and the Pentagon. You Uh, said Western Europe and the Pentagon. After you retired from there, did you also not start in another type of service? I started a second career in 1999 with the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and I retired from Kentucky three months ago. What did you do for the Commonwealth of Kentucky? What was your position? I was a probation and parole officer for the Justice Cabinet for mm, the Commonwealth okay. of Kentucky. majority of your lives, you've been in a rather unique position as far as dealing with men is concerned. When you say that? Yes, that's correct. I know the one ministry you're doing right now that really has your heart. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? A ministry that I have been a part of for many years is called the Mentoring Ministry for Men. This is a ministry that was started at Southeast Christian about 16 years ago, and I have been a mentor at Southeast for the last 15 years. And when you say you're a mentor, what does that mean? What does that entail? It's basically a discipleship ministry. It's a ministry where we work with men one-on-one. We have several goals in mind when we work with a man. The first is wherever he is spiritually, we want to help him, guide him, move him, and challenge him to the next spiritual level, whatever that is for that particular man. So it doesn't matter if he's a new believer or if he's coming out of seminary. We work with both. Then we will work with that man to help him get to the next spiritual level. The second goal is if he's not connected to other Christian men, then we're going to push him to get connected to other strong Christian men. And then the third goal is if he's not serving in the church, then we want to push him to serve wherever the Holy Spirit leads him to go. So basically what you just stated there was growth, connection, and service. Growth, connection, and service are the three goals. And so I imagine you probably mentored a lot of men over the years. Are there any common problems that you find a lot of Christian men encountering? The most common problem, particularly with married men, generally is that they are struggling in their marriages. There's usually something wrong in the home. That's not every man, but the majority of men that ministry has dealt with over the years have struggled in their marriage. They're not being the spiritual leaders that the Bible has called them to be. Would you say that's correct? That is correct. And I know sometimes, particularly with non-belief, they say that the Bible teaches patriarchy as far as the man dominating and controlling the woman. Would you agree with that characterization or that teaching? I would agree with that. And so how would you define a biblical husband? What does that sort of look like? I would refer back to Ephesians 5.25, which says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. A home that is run from a biblical view would be a home where the husband submits to Christ as the head of the home, and then the wife submits to the leadership of her husband. So that there is an order in the home. There again, it's not that the wife simply submits to her husband. If you go back and listen to that verse again, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Then we serve our wives in such a way that we sacrifice ourselves to make sure that she is completely taken care of in every respect. I'm sure that sort of resonates with you as a person who's in the military because 
basically what we were asking many people in the military is to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, for the protection of the country. Would you agree with that? Correct. As we serve the country, we put ourselves in the position of sacrificing ourselves, even our physical selves, for the ultimate goal of sustaining the freedom of our country. We talked about growth. We talked about connectedness. Why is it so important, you believe, for Christian men to be, as you say, connected to one another? Connection has a number of good things attached to it. One is that in and of itself, when the mentoring relationship comes to a formal end, then the mentor wants to be able to pass the man off to other strong connections because Life has its ups and downs, and we need to be connected to other people who can surround us, who can love us unconditionally, who can encourage us when we're going through difficult times, and who can pray for us as we need prayer on a regular basis. Being surrounded by other strong Christian men can help us to live a life of victory and sustain that life of victory, because a man doesn't really matter how much he knows of the Bible if he's by himself in mm-hmm. isolation. He is much more in a position of being defeated in his life than if he was connected to other strong guys. Talked about isolation. Dr. Simon, he just tapped right into that. Right now, during this big crisis, they talk about social distancing and encouraging us to stay home. How are you trying to encourage, trying to lead Christian men? to respond to this current crisis? Even during today's time? Yes. Okay. When we first went into basically our national mode of social distancing and staying home, for the first week of that, as I'm sure it did many people, it impacted me to the point where I just kind of sat in place, stunned that I was having to sit still because I'm not used to sitting still. I'm Mm -hmm. not used to not being connected. As I began to come out of that fog, if you will, realizing that I, as much as anyone else, need to stay connected, I began using social platforms to keep connections going. For example, you mentioned earlier in the conversation that I lead a men's group through Southeast Christian that involves over 40 men. And in order for us to stay connected, We're not able to do face-to-face contact like we normally do, but the next best thing is having online meetings where we can still have a level of connection to maintain us through this particular national situation that we have. And that has really been through a number of these meetings now in different ministries at Southeast, and it's really afforded us the ability to not only stay connected, but to continue to advance God's kingdom in the different areas that God has me in. So you're still serving. Not only staying connected, but you're still serving and other men are still serving as well? Correct. And for those men, for example, in my men's group, who I haven't seen for the last two weekly meetings, we're reaching out to those men individually to make sure, first of all, that they're okay. Secondly, to encourage them to stay connected to us during this period of time. Because I have already found that Through this very unique national situation, some men are just not used to social online meetings or they just don't feel comfortable with doing that. So I stress to them, even individually, that the importance of staying connected even more so while we're having to practice staying at home is even more essential now than ever. We stay connected on some level. We talked about mentoring spiritual growth and connectedness and service. Is it really that important from your understanding for men to be discipled, mentored? Does that really have any type of impact on the nation? I mean, maybe it helped that one family on the nation. Does it help there at all? It helps on every level. Really, the mentoring, again, is it's discipleship. It's seeing the Great Commission in Matthew 28 played out. Jesus said before he ascended into heaven to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So through mentoring and discipleship, we're actually making disciples 
which is a multiplication process, which not only affects our individual lives as men, but also affects our homes and affects other homes because a man engages in the process described in the Great Commission, a ripple effect goes out into the community. It may start with me, but it's going to impact over time hundreds of other people that I don't even know. I'm a big political science and history buff type person. I've always been amazed that when you read about, let's say, for example, some president, decisions they've made at at critical moments, when you go in the background, you oftentimes will find Dr. Simon Howe. They've been taught the faith early basis. And even if they've veered away from it a little bit at that, they have a tendency to come back at a critical time. One example in particular that Brother Barry is aware of this person or not, but it was Eldridge Cleaver. He was the Minister of Information for the Black Panther Party. A lot of people didn't really realize how, quote unquote, revolutionary the Black Panther Party was until people like Eldridge Cleaver in interviews started telling them certain things. And as a quick aside, one of them was that they said they checked out the border that the United States shared on with Mexico and how they're going to use the Mexican side of the border to launch guerrilla attacks into the United States. So when they brought up that wall question, I just sort of chuckled because I said, maybe Eldridge talked to President Trump. He's a Marxist, and he put out this book, Soul on Ice. And in the book, Soul on Ice, he openly talked about how he raped women. He first would practice on black women, and then he started raping white women. That was his way of sort of fighting against the white power structure. This is in the book, Soul on Ice. Don't take my word for it. Read it yourself. That's how demented that man was. So after a particular shootout they had with the police in California, he fled the country and went to different places, North Korea, Algeria, all these were socialist regimes. And then in France, he had a vision. And his vision, he saw Marx, Lenin, And I think he said Stalin and Mao. Then he saw Christ. Really? People knew his background as much as I had known. That was utterly amazing to have that kind of vision. And so he said he knew he had to turn to God. He had to turn to Christ. Wow. But he did not know how to do it. He didn't know what to do, what to pray. So what happened was he said, oh, he fell back on a prayer his aunt taught him. When he was a little boy. Wow. And then he, he said that prayer. It came back to me, said that he recited that prayer and then went back to the United States, went back to the United States to, to face the music, so to speak. And he was a born again Christian. And then he wrote wow. a second book called Soul on Fire. And I say all that, that's a long roundabout way of saying the importance of laying some roots yeah. with people yeah. at an early age. Because obviously Eldridge is. Far, far away from God when he's with the Black Panther Party. But still, he had a seed that was planted by his aunt wow. when he was young. That's and he was amazing. able to fall upon that seed. That's an amazing story. And so, but Brother Barry, were you raised a believer? I was raised in a Christian home and accepted Christ when I was a child. When you were a child. But something happened at one point in your life that you sort of veered away a little bit from Christ? Could you talk to us about that a little bit? At age 21 is when I joined the Army and left home for the first time. I had been away from home for about six months. Of course, one of the things that I didn't make a good transition to in the military was to find a good home church. I had a great home church in the hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, but did not really pursue hard a good church base where I was at. And so about six months after I joined the military at age 21, I stopped going to church. But there was something else at work in my life that caused me to not pursue church at that point. And that was that as a young man, particularly as a 16-year-old, right up through my entry into the military, I was really struggling with lust, as most young males do. And I didn't understand why I couldn't have victory in that area of my life, why I couldn't get control of that area. And so I decided at age 21 that I would see where this road of pleasure goes. I'm not going to fight this anymore. I'm just going to see where this goes. 
and wherever it leads it is where it leads. Well, that decision at 21 put me on a path that you can easily see in Scripture in Luke 15 that uh, where the, Jesus talked about the prodigal son. And so mm -hmm. as the prodigal son for me at age 21, I left the church. I didn't really turn my back on God. I never said I didn't believe in or believe in him. But I left the body of Christ to pursue this road of pleasure. I didn't enter a church again until I was 15 years later. And by mm -hmm. the time that I came back to church, I was in my third marriage. I was never faithful to anyone because I was always looking outside of the marriage for, again, this road of pleasure was taking me in places that I never thought I would go. So I was never faithful to anyone. I was always had connections outside of the home for sexual contact. Even after I came back to church 15 years later, I was in such bondage for sexual sin that I really wasn't even sure how to come out of the pit that I was in. And so I was about 44 years old. You can see right there that I've already gone about 23 years of my life before it finally hits me one day, even after being back in church, that if I don't repent, if I don't get in right relationship with God again, at least for me, I felt like I was, was going to be eternally separated from God. That I had lost my salvation completely. God had not been anywhere on my radar screen in my life for over 20 years at that point. And so I knew that I needed to get right with God again. And so early 2003, 17 years ago, I made that decision to come back to God, just like the prodigal son did in Luke 15. It says that the son came to his senses while he was in the pit. He realized where he was. He remembered his father, made a plan to go home. And he took a step to go home, and that's what I did. I took a definite step to reconcile myself back to God at the end of the service one day. I hooked in with someone that in most churches it would be called an altar worker. In most churches, Southeast doesn't call them that. I linked in with a man who I'd never met before, and he asked me what I had come forward at the end of the service about. And I said, I've come to confess what I've been doing in secret for the last 20 plus years of my life. And so I confessed to this man many of the secrets that I said I would take to my grave, told him what I had been involved in, and he listened patiently. And at the end of that time of just releasing all of these dark secrets of my life to this man, I felt a huge weight come off of my shoulders. And I will also tell you that as part of that story, I told this altar worker that I wanted to be baptized again. I was baptized as a child in a Southern Baptist home. It was a real baptism, and I remember it well. But I wanted to be baptized as an adult because I wanted to remember that day when I came back to God. And he mm -hmm. said, well, we can certainly do that. How about next weekend? And so we set that up. And the day that I had walked forward to do this confession and reconcile myself back to God, I went home that afternoon and gathered up about 20 years worth of pornography that I had acquired and bought from various places in the world and threw everything that I had away. Never too so late. When I came bro. back the following weekend for the baptism, I had already basically cleaned my house out. Also, I will tell you that in those last few years of being the prodigal son in the distant country and hooking in with all kinds of different people. Through reckless behavior, I had gotten an incurable sexually transmitted disease. I couldn't even get angry about that because I didn't even know who I got it from. But when I went to the baptism the following weekend and stepped into the, that baptismal pool, not only did God reconcile me spiritually, but he healed me physically in the same moment. I didn't ask him to heal me physically, but he did. And so I was reconciled and healed physically in the same moment. you got less than a minute left. I know that your men's group meets every Tuesday at Southeast. Men from other churches are allowed to participate. Is that true? That is correct. And they can call the number there at Southeast if they want to hook up with you. And I just want to say the importance of raising up 
godly men. Dr. Simon, people like you are prime examples of the importance of doing that, raising up godly men. The communities, our families, our nation needs that, needs more of that. And I think Dr. Simon is what time is that meeting at Southeast? Meets every Tuesday at 6.30. Isn't that right, brother? 6.30. Tuesday evening at 6.30. Wow, that's terrific. Well, that was a great presentation. God bless you. We're running out of time. Thanks again and tuning in next week for the rest of the news. Hi, I'm Dr. Frank Simon. I'm an allergist and family doctor, board certified in both allergy and internal medicine. I specialize in allergy, headaches, sinus, hives, cough, asthma, hypertension, and diabetes. We're located at 1404 Browns Lane near Norton Suburban Hospital. Our phone number is 895-5088. We can see you tomorrow. Hello, this is Frank Simon with the rest of the news, and there's a lot going on. If you have been watching the news, and there are a lot of things that are going on, they're not even on the news. We have Brother John Brewer with us today. We want to go over some of the videos that have come across the internet that amplify what's going on with this coronavirus. And I think everybody is probably sick of hearing about the coronavirus, but really what they need to understand is what's behind the coronavirus and who's behind the coronavirus. We're not going to lay all of our bets on any one particular subject, but we are going to sit there and say we do know where it comes from. It didn't come from America. So we're going to give you some evidence-based talk today. Let me see if we can bring up this first video here. This is Dr. Boyle, who is a scientist, and he's got some ideas where this whole thing came from. President, U.S. intelligence is saying this week that the coronavirus likely came from a level four lab in Wuhan. There's also another report that the NIH under the Obama administration in 2015 gave that lab $3.7 billion in a grant. Why would the U.S. give a grant like that to China? The Obama administration gave them a grant of $3.7 million. I've been hearing about that. And we've instructed that if any grants are going to that area, we're looking at it literally about an hour ago. And also early in the morning, we will end that grant very quickly. So that's interesting that under the Obama administration, the National Institute of Health gave $3.7 million to Wuhan, presumably to make this virus. Yeah, and it backs up to what we said last week. Now we're going to show the video here. It backs up to that. What it does is the director or the person that put together the bioweapons law in the U.S. And around 1989, and who is very, very well known, very respected. He knows what he's talking about. So we clipped just a very small part for you so that you can actually understand what's going on. If you listen carefully, especially to the end, that'll help you out a lot. This is Dr. Boyd. Uh, recent scientific study published in Antiviral Research 10 February 2020 by three scientists from France and one from Montreal who did a a genetic analysis of the Wuhan coronavirus and they said, quote, it may provide a gain of function of the 219 coronavirus for efficient spreading in the human population compared to other viruses. Now, that's just a short clip and we could go into that more saying that the Chinese were trying to increase the function of That was their goal. At each of these labs, they were looking at trying to expand its ability to infect infect people people and to make it worse, make them sicker. They used to say, all roads lead to Rome. That's an old saying, but all roads seem to lead back to Wuhan. Now, one of the things that we talked about at the beginning, and everybody talked about it at the beginning. This was the Chinese explanation. Well, it must have come from this wet market, wet market called a wet market, where they had all kinds of animals, and they'd stack them in cages, one over the other, and all the different secretions. Somehow it jumped 
from a bat, and then it jumped to the human species. But that doesn't seem to make sense because when we looked at this a little further, last week we talked about we talked about a scientist in China who had been studying these bats. Yeah. Her name was Sing, I think. Sing actually found a way to make it cross over into the human species. Yeah, easier to catch it. Easier to catch it. So it's a thing that they bioengineered. In fact, what caught my attention first with this is when I heard them say at the very beginning, no, we don't want any extra help. We're working on a vaccine ourselves. We're going to do some genetics engineering and whatever. That told me that they had the ability to genetically engineer something like a virus. And Wuhan just seems to actually prove it time after time. This is like the third coronavirus to come out of there. During the Obama administration, the NIH gave them money to do whatever they do with this virus. Now, it was talked about in the news in that first clip that we watched, $3.7 million grant. But that had started out of North Carolina, and North Carolina, I think Francis Wool probably called them out on it and said, you all should not be doing this. So what it looks like is it looks like they decided to go around the system and do it over in China. Very similar to the other deep state type of things that they've done. Taking an approach that doesn't fall under our laws, it's an international thing. This is the time to be a conspiracy theorist. Back in the day, maybe there wasn't as many conspiracies. I don't know, but it seems like today, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you're standing on pretty good ground. Because somebody in the NIH gave Wuhan all that $3.7 million. They had to approve it. It had to get by somebody's eyes. You would think that the security apparatus would have known about that as well. Homeland Security or somebody had to know something. So what we're looking at is, last week we talked about how it had the age structure had parts of the AIDS structure. Virus, yeah. yeah. The AIDS virus was snapped in there. Some. And that just doesn't happen. By accident. By accident. No. Remember, there was that one real quick last part there about the gain of function. That is a term that Francis Boyle pointed out that's used almost exclusively for bioweapons, making, yeah. making yeah. something more lethal. What we in America are facing is a bioweapon that has been released intentionally or unintentionally. Curious, this is another conspiracy, okay, but nevertheless, the dots are lining up. Right after the impeachment process of President Trump kind of fell to nothing, it was less than a they month. They came up with yes, this Yes, it was less than a month before this started. 